Among the major aircraft companies, Convair was one of the first to incorporate in its total weapon system concept a belief in the effectiveness of air-to-surface missiles and the practicality of high-performance aircraft, particularly the B-58, as aerial launching platforms for such missiles. In the fall of 1957, a like-minded organization, Lockheed Missile Systems Division, became associated with Convair to propose to the Air Force a test program for demonstrating the advantages of the air-launched ballistic missile, or ALBUM. In June 1958, these Convair Lockheed proposals resulted in a contract calling for a program of four test firings. The purpose of this report is to give an accounting of these four test launches as well as a final appraisal of the program's accomplishments measured against its original goals. A good starting point is with the album itself, which was manufactured by Lockheed under contract to Convair, using mainly off-the-shelf hardware for speed and economy of manufacture. The missile was powered by a solid propellant rocket engine and used aerodynamic services for stabilization and control. Its overall length, 30 feet. Maximum diameter, 31 inches. The gross weight at launch was over 12,000 pounds. A reinforced plastic nose cone was designed to burn or break away during re-entry, exposing the heat sink type nose cone. The space behind the cone contained the control and telemetering equipment. For the first two tests, a programmed autopilot controlled the missile flight path, while the final pair of launches were controlled by Autonetics inertial guidance systems. Ballast was provided both for adjustment of the center of gravity and simulation of an actual payload. The destruct system was directly forward of the Firecall XM-20 rocket engine the controllable fins, hydraulic system, and rocket nozzle in the aft barrel section. At Convair Fort Worth, the necessary modifications for the B-58 to serve as a missile carrier were accomplished as scheduled. Chief of these was the design and fabrication of a special pylon adapter, capable of being connected to the airplane by its regular free-fall bomb pod hooks. So prepared, B-58 No. 1 arrived at Eglin Air Force Base 11 August 1958. Here, a minimum of further adjustments was needed for the attachment and release gear, with one shakedown flight made by way of final checkout. The B-58 carrier was staged out of Eglin Air Force Base, with the test to be made over the Atlantic Missile Range off Cape Canaveral. The first album launch had an auspicious beginning with a clean separation and fall away from the B-58, followed by ignition according to schedule within six seconds. But shortly thereafter, the missile departed from plan by developing uncontrolled spiral oscillations. These continued until impact. One fortunate aspect of the flight was the reception of good telemetering throughout. This furnished the data by which the causes of malfunction were pinpointed and the proper fixes were made. So corrected, the second album was brought to Convair where it was run through the analog computer for a double assurance on the fixes. At Eglin, preparations for its test launch, while now nearly routine because of the experience gleaned from the first flight, were nevertheless thorough. After some weather delay, the second test was scheduled for 19 December when conditions favored visual tracking. Central Control at Cape Canaveral was in full charge of operations while maintaining communications with Eglin, the GCI stations at Tyndall and MacDill Air Force bases, and the aircraft. 
Its flight path having been plotted from takeoff, the B-58 soon reached the area under the immediate direction of central control and was vectored on the launch pattern. The countdown began as the aircraft neared launch position, heading 090, altitude 40,000 feet, speed Mach 1.46. Although a last-minute aborting of the photographic chase planes prevented air-to-air -air coverage, this footage from ground cameras shows the perfect release by the carrier B-58 of the missile, which functioned correctly thereafter until impact. Its speed reached Mach 6, with the album obtaining an apogee of more than 250,000 feet. At 51 seconds after release, the autopilot commanded a programmed roll rate of 40 degrees per second, which continued until flight termination 185 miles from the launch point. This successful supersonic air launching of a ballistic missile was only the first of several significant pioneer landmarks to be achieved before conclusion of the album program. It also marked the beginning of a radically revised and more ambitious concept for album's future role, whose outcome we will learn later. With Eglin Air Force Base again the point of origin, there took place on June 4th, 1959, album launch number three, the first ever made of a ballistic missile with an inertial guidance system. From the steady level platform provided by the carrier B-58, the missile, already traveling at Mach 1.46, was released and dropped away cleanly. Ignition occurred approximately six and a half seconds later. Unfortunately, photographic coverage of the launch's later stages was inadequate. So let's have a diagram show us the planned subsequent flight of the missile. After release, the missile was to take a 90 degree north heading, go to an altitude of 32 nautical miles, cover a range of 181 nautical miles from release to impact, the total flight time being 240 seconds. Because of technical discrepancies in the missile, this blueprint was not adhered to with complete accuracy in every phase of the flight. However, test launch three must be considered successful since most of its major objectives were achieved. Flight of the missile was stable and album was shown to have followed the guidance system's commands perfectly. Concurrently with this test program, Convair had been studying the many problems presented by album in that other role mentioned earlier. In November 1958, the result was a submission of new proposals to the Air Force. A go-ahead was authorized and the job defined by revised contract in April 1959. The new definition, to intercept and photograph an object put in space by man and so accomplish the first satellite reconnaissance in history. For such a challenging assignment, obviously some changes in album's construction would be needed. First, to provide space for equipment, a new longer nose cone was designed to serve as a re-entry vehicle. Next, since its forthcoming role would involve higher trajectories and smaller loads with the resulting decrease in temperatures, the missile was lightened throughout. This was accomplished by internal featherweighting, removing no longer needed ballast, and substituting aluminum for steel where feasible, such as for the fin ribs and the panels along the missile's skin. These modifications also required some rewiring. Finally, the all-important re-entry vehicle. This was now fitted with eyes and enlarged to allow installation of 13 carefully positioned cameras. Of these, nine were for obtaining pictures of the satellite, while four were to photograph the Earth from very high altitude. The vehicle also included a recovery unit from Cook Research, containing a parachute, balloon, chaff dye marker, radio transmitter, flashing light, and even shark repellent for locating the vehicle after re-entry. In the late summer of 1959, the successful orbiting of Explorer 4 gave Album its target. At Eglin, crews made preparations following procedures necessarily revamped for the first intercept in space. As one example of the pinpoint precision required, 
Here we see alignment of the guidance table platform, necessarily a painstaking process, since a fractional error at this point would be exaggerated by miles over album's total projected course. With the Atlantic Missile Range off Cape Canaveral, again the planned scene of operation, Album was ready three or four days in advance of the first intercept attempt. It quickly became apparent, however, that data received from the satellite was both insufficient and erroneous. Consequently, the attempt had to be canceled. A practice flight was made over the run to test out procedures. A few weeks later, Discoverer 5 went into orbit. Its pre-calculated path indicated a possible course over Eglin and thence on a line south above the Gulf. Here an intercept was planned. With all in readiness, the basic data was again insufficient. A last minute shift in prediction also showed the satellite passing over New Orleans, where obviously no launch could be made in the vicinity of such a populated area. There followed a period of intensified effort to upgrade procedures for obtaining reliable data. As a firming of predictions on the orbit seemed to offer reasonable chances of a successful intercept, a third scheduling of an Album 4 launch was set up for the week of 20 to 26 September. Air Force boats left Eglin with sufficient lead time to reach the estimated area in the Gulf of Mexico for a recovery of the re-entry vehicle, and the flight took place on September 22nd. Plans called for launching at a point 80 miles due south of Destin, Florida, over the Gulf, at a speed of approximately Mach 2, and altitude of around 40,000 feet. At the actual time of launch, the B-58 was on its assigned ground track for putting the missile into the path of the orbit, speed Mach 2, altitude 37,500 feet. Aircraft maneuvers throughout were accomplished exactly as planned. Release was effected cleanly as usual, two seconds off the predetermined time, so well within the 10 second tolerance for a successful intercept. After ignition of the rocket engine in the proper manner, the missile began its prescribed pull-up into the desired ballistics path. Soon thereafter, the brief telemetry received at Eglin indicated a malfunction in the missile. At 30 seconds following drop, all intelligence links with Album were lost. However, ground observation of its smoke trail showed a continuance of normal performance. While undoubtedly the malfunction altered its path sufficiently to destroy the timing and accuracy necessary for satellite intercept, the probability is that the missile did accomplish a very high altitude ballistics flight. The loss of data links also meant that the information needed for determining its impact point was unavailable. This greatly reduced the probability of recovery, a fact borne out when several hours' search failed to uncover any trace of the re-entry vehicle. This first attempt in history and reconnaissance of a satellite marked the end of the album series of test flights. While a mechanical malfunction prevented accomplishment of its major objective, photography of the satellite, the mission registered several highly significant achievements for the future. Procedures for more accurate predictions of the satellite's orbit, as well as operational procedures for a quick reaction capability were established and verified. Considering the required several hours of countdown and one hour of flight by the B-58 to position, the launching of Album 4 within two seconds of the time determined well in advance was also an impressive feat. When viewed in its entirety, the Album program likewise produced impressive proof of the important advantages inherent in the airborne launch. Freedom from geography, or conversely, the ability to launch anywhere. Simplicity especially when compared to the complexity of facilities, personnel, and operations required for ground launches. Economy. Since the air-breathing B-58 is, in effect, a recoverable first-stage booster for the missile. In the aggregate, the accomplishments of this test program proved the unique practicality of the B-58 as a carrier for Alvin.
It demonstrated the feasibility of the air-launched ballistic missile, either as a versatile weapons system or a potential explorer into space. <laughs>